I'm Dale Winling, and um, we'll talk about the collaboration, but um, I'm an urban historian. One of the key considerations, one of the key questions of urban history for people who study 20th century U.S. history is um, what is the kind of origins and what are the mechanisms of um, like creating and reinforcing and institutionalizing racial inequality. And that's what brought me to the question of redlining and um, you know, the denial of mortgage funding and federal resources for cities and people who live in cities. Um, this is something that a lot of other historians have studied and um, thought about over time. Um, but uh, I and a number of the collaborators realized that there's a wide array of um, archival material in the National Archives and Archives too, kind of testifying to um, the role of the federal government in um, the process of kind of expanding and reinforcing racial segregation, racial inequality, and uh, a number of other factors like the racial wealth gap um, as well as like education, opportunity, unequal school funding, and so forth. So those concerns, I think, led us to this, um, the study of this program and to this particular kind of interactive, interactive um, mapping project. And we realized, so redlining specifically, historically, uh, refers to this program um, created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation and then kind of extended by the Federal Housing Administration, Hulk and FHA, which come out of the New Deal, the 1930s, this Great Depression, um, as many as one half of all homes with mortgages were in default. There's a um, residential like home finance crisis as part of the broader economic crisis. And um, the Roosevelt administration um, creates Hulk to kind of give, uh, uh, cr create emergency money to refinance homes and clear off um, mortgage company and bank, um, bank balance sheets. Um, and then FHA is a long-term um, agency to restructure the housing market to kind of prevent a crisis like that from happening ever again. And so in the course of this, once the federal government refinances a million homes, or potentially um, provides mortgage guarantees for millions more homes over the course of the late 1930s, the 1940s, 1950s, and going forward, once the federal government is on the hook for um, the value of these homes and these mortgages, they wanna know where is a good investment? Like where shall we facilitate investment? And um, how can cre we create like a national clearinghouse of data? Um, the real estate had been much more locally oriented and there was not like a national kind of database like Zillow or Redfin or something along those lines in the present. And so um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation sought to create this. So what they did was they sent surveys out to um, real estate agents and home appraisers and lenders and real estate developers in cities across the country. Um, and these survey results, the data that they tabulated um, for more than 200 cities is what we found in the, um, in the National Archives and Archives 2, which is a, another facility in College Park, Maryland. Um, and with these kind of survey results and data tabulations, um, the, the federal bureaucrats in the Homeowners Loan Corporation also asked, um, where are the neighborhood boundaries? What's a good neighborhood and what are the features of it? What's a bad neighborhood or a risky neighborhood? And um, how will we recognize it? And what should we warn um, our like insurance agents about? Or shall we um, warn local appraisers about? And so they created um, a set of more than 150 color-coded maps. They basically said for every city that was more than 40,000 in population across the U.S., um, there's four categories. A, green colored, the best neighborhood, like basically the professional class lives in these neighborhoods. Um, B, still desirable, not quite the absolutely most desirable neighborhoods, but still like um, 
high stable home values, um, uh, a lot of civic, civic amenities and so forth. Um, C, um, definitely declining. And these are yellow colored. And these were judged as um, no longer desirable, um, probably characterized by the influx of um, immigrants, um, or in some cases, a handful of African Americans, but basically people were, uh, the professional class was moving out of these neighborhoods and the city was probably no longer investing in these neighborhoods. Um, and it was like, declining or becoming less less desirable in the evaluation of real estate developers, agents, and insurance agents. And then D, the red neighborhoods, um, called hazardous. Um, and this, they say, all of those changes that we would see in the yellow or C neighborhoods have already happened in D neighborhoods, um, basically uh, largely characterized by minority populations, whether it be um, immigrant or African-American, um, suffering from a lack of civic infrastructure, uh, poor, poor schools, for example, and um, would be a place that was, um, people would be reluctant to make loans in except under exceptional circumstances. So these were the ratings, these were the meanings of the colors in these redlining maps created by the federal government um, based on local knowledge. Yep. You have your first question already about this data. Okay, map, and what is that? The Map Ninja is asking uh, like, like who made these determinations? Um, they say, can you talk more about the surveys, who they were sent to and what what they were asked, like how, how did these classifications come about? Yeah, absolutely. And um, maybe um, Rob, you can pull up just a, um, maybe a scan of a, um, of an area description. And they sent out a form. So bureaucrats within the homeowners loan corporation developed these forms and sent them out. And they would ask, for example, um, who, like what are the favorable influences you see here? Um, convenience to San Francisco transportation. That's great. Detrimental influences, infiltration of colored residents, for example. They would also ask, like, what's the ethnic mix? Um, and uh, as well as, like, what were the home values? What's the proportion of rentals? What is the housing stock? And things like this. In these um, forms were sent to um, people who were seen as leaders uh, in the real estate industry, right? So um, uh, Rob's hovering over a couple of people who are named for um, helping create the um, city of Oakland area descriptions and maps. In some cases, um, we know their names and those, those local informants are on the, um, um, their names are in the National Archives. In some cases, it's harder to track those, those people down, but they're, but they're generally kind of like local leaders within the industry. And, um, and then for making the maps, which we said like kind of the, the, the maps are um, visually evocative and they're probably like the best known. That's where we get the term redlining for the red colored neighborhoods. Um, there were um, like map makers within the homeowners loan corporation who would would have conversations and say like what's what's the boundary of this neighborhood is it a set of railroad tracks is it the edge of a park is it um, the transition from a residential neighborhood to a commercial um, street or something along those lines and as an example of the kind of um, answers that people would give um, that an area that may be familiar to, to some of the people listening. Um, in this neighborhood in um, Oakland, California, it was redlined, it was um, rated D, hazardous. Um, D5, clarifying remarks say, unless one knows about the colored families living in this district, there is no means of distinguishing their homes from those of their white neighbors. The homes of the Negroes are in many instances better kept than the adjoining homes of white owners and loans in this area should be governed according to hazard, right? And so um, essentially what they're saying is we've, and we've um, 
checked the data across all area descriptions across the country, if there were as many as 10% of the population was African American, um, they'd be rated as hazardous, D. It's usually as, um, as little as 5% would um, give a D rating. Um, and, and I wanna kind of like sum up or end this introduction, we'll talk about um, the design, the site and project and so forth. The term redlining, you may have seen in the New York Times Magazine, um, Nicole Hannah Jones wrote an article called What is Owed about reparations, talks about redlining, um, and a number of other like journalists have written about this. And um, right now, the term redlining kind of stands in for um, specifically for the denial of mortgages or the denial of insurance or the denial of resources to communities of color. And um, this, uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, these maps that we're talking about, like I said, were the origins of this term. And um, we think, I mean, when we look at these maps, we can see some conflicting information like African-American owned homes are actually better kept than white owned, owned, white owned homes. But um, so you may, uh, lenders uh, proceed carefully with making loans, um, but the neighborhood is still called hazardous and given a D rating. So these, um, these maps and these ratings, we should not think of them as determinative. However, um, one of the ways that I talk about um, these maps is that they're like the Rosetta Stone of American cities. Mm. Um, they won't tell you what any particular um, neighborhood, like whether they got loans or not, but it's a way of understanding the broader patterns. And if you look at a city that you don't know, when I go to a new city, I look at the, um, the redlining map, the, the Homeowners Loan Corporation map, and I think like, aha, I get it. Like this is probably where the African Americans lived, and this is probably where like the bottoms district are, like the less desirable housing, and you can get a feel for um, even the conditions now, in part because this reinforced the kind of biases and discriminatory practices, but also the civic um, decisions about infrastructure um, that happened since the 1930s. And Rob um, has pulled up a couple, um, a couple other examples. We have a handful of exceptions where, um, you know, like an African American neighborhood is not um, given a um, D rating, but there's only one or two or three of these across the country. And we can think about this project as helping us look back. Um, and understanding, it gives us a shorthand or a way to um, think about equity and especially spatial inequities in the past and how that translates across the 20th century and like into the, into the present. Um, Rob, do you want to pick it up? Okay, so we've got a, a question. I'll jump to North Carolina. Let's, uh, let's just do that real quick. Um, so I, I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, some of the design and development decisions we made in this map. Um, uh, let, so let me let me jump around. So like one thing I guess I'd emphasize is that we were trying to really be uh, mindful of the historicity of these documents. Like we you can digitize everything, uh, and I, but obviously we have these kind of incredible uh, raster maps that uh, you know are are so historically important that we wanted to put those front and center. Um, and then we also have uh, Sorry, this is stupid. Why am I? Saying it? Okay, uh, there we go. There's North Carolina. There's five cities in, in North Carolina. I get happy to jump into any of them. They're actually really pretty remarkable. Let's go down to Winston Salem. Um, and so, and well, so we wanted to, um, like, I always find myself doing this when I'm on a presentation like this one. So let's let's open this thing up because you, you know I'll, I'm not sure that any of these are particularly interesting. I'm just jumping into them. Uh, I mean, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, fairly good Negro properties along Woodland and, and Cleveland avenues, and. For me, what I do is I, I seldom uh, just end up reading from this. I always show the scan because I think it's scan uh, the image, which like, why is it not coming up? Which is like weird. Let's not, let's ignore that one. Uh, what the heck's happened on that one? Let's try this one. Uh, show the scan. Reload. Here's 
Um, the oh crap, I'll just jump to a better one. Tacoma, let's go to Tacoma. Uh, this, is, this is always an example I end up using, um, which is uh, like, uh, oh, it's, I know why it was, I was scrolled over. Um, uh, so this is this, uh, this neighborhood in, in Tacoma, which is where I went to college. And uh, so it's a little bit, just a few blocks to the Northwest of, of where I, I did my undergraduate work. And uh, let me close this and sh uh, show this, let's show the map. And it's in this neighborhood called the Proctor District. Uh, and uh, it was a it was a kind of middle class neighborhood, uh, but they carved out this is Proctor District too, this D one area, and they carved out a little bit of that that area and gave it a D. And the reason the explanation is, and you're probably reading over there, but I always go to the scan, which is is at the top. Uh, uh, except as known in clarifying remarks below, this area is identical in all respects to area B two, which is because it's part of that. It's just part of the Proctor District. Um, but they explain three highly respected Negro families own homes and live in the middle block of this area facing Verde Street. While very much above the average of their race, it is quite generally recognized by realtors that their presence seriously detracts from the desirability of their immediate neighborhood. So I take that to mean like three highly respected Negro families above the average of the race. It means they're like middle class families, right? They're, they're probably, uh, probably uh, more well to do than their white neighbors. Um, but still, there's an insistence that, um, you know, their presence of these three families uh, re results in this kind of carving up of this neighborhood, a portion of which needs to be redlining as they adhere to the logic of segregation and the logic of redlining. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that this, uh, this program did so much to uh, advance and to calcify. Um, so, uh, so again, like uh, really put as much of the of the uh, original documents there for people to look at. But then we also want to let me actually change that. So, uh, but obviously, like one of the I guess the kind of visual arguments of this is that, um, uh, and it, and we're relying on people knowing their own city, right? Because people come in here, they 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 always gravitate. In fact, we we do a little geo referencing, and we jump them into their neighborhood if we can. Um, uh, and uh, so they know the city and they know the contours of wealth and inequality in their own city and they know the contours of, set of you know, 21st century segregation in their city and, and the comment that's often when I, you know, somebody hasn't seen a map, like the first thing they often say is like, wow, I recognize that, that looks so much like my city today. And so we're, uh, we're kind of working, uh, like there's a, there's a visual argument or an arg a presumption that we're, uh, we're uh, assumption we're making about our audience is that they'll bring their knowledge of where they're living, of where they're interested in, and see those uh, continuities and, and sometimes changes between the past and the present, and uh, and um, and uh, maybe jump to uh, not too much of a conclusion. We don't want to, but because obviously this is not causal all that, but it's one of the causal factors of of uh, the, uh, like the calcification, persistence, uh, the intractability of uh, of uh, poverty and privilege in different parts of American cities that persists over generations. Um, and we visually make some design choices to kind of bring that home. So we want people to make those connections between past and present. So one thing we do is we let them get rid of the map and just show the, show the, uh, uh, show the polygons uh, with this overlaid over the modern uh, streetscape, uh, kindly provided by Mapbox. Mapbox has been great <laughs> about this. We really, we really appreciate it because really has elevated it. Um, and then, but the other thing we've done is like, uh, and this is design, is to kind of bring both of these, juxtapose both of these. So we, um, I wanted this effect. I mean, get, not to get too designy and, and geeky. It's like I realized, like I need a hover over just to make sure that people know that they can click on these things. And originally, what I was doing is I had the, I had uh, this full map, and I I uh, over, I had a polygon so I could, that's transparent and clickable, and I would just uh, make that um, a little bit of blue in this case, and uh, and overlay that over the kind of uh, washed out. Uh, uh, grayscaled map, um, and then, but I, it looked fake. It looked, it didn't, it didn't respect the historicity the way I wanted it to. And it occurred to me what you could do is uh, we could cut. We had seven thousand of these neighborhoods. We can make individual tile pyramids for each and every one of them. So what you're saying is I gray out the the background raster, and I have a B two, which is this own individual tile pyramid that's laid over the top of that. Um, uh, and so we can you can have this effect, which I think again respects the historicity of it. And like it's like attention to detail about these uh, design elements that I think 
I, I feel like makes a difference and I take some pride in. Um, and, uh, and once you have that, you can obviously, uh, you can stitch those things back together and uh, get rid of everything on the map that, um, uh, that ex except for the areas that were graded in the past, which um, has uh, two effects. Like one is to, I think, amplify that, that visual argument or visual prompt we're trying to, uh, to make, which is to connect the past and the present, to see these red line neighborhoods uh, very much just kind of uh, over overlaid and, and and very much connected to the contemporary cityscape. And then the other thing it does is um, let me go to uh, let me go to Brooklyn. Uh, it makes it uh, <laughs> it solves some some design uh, challenges we had, which is uh, places that have a lot of maps uh, that overlay one another. So you get this um, this. Uh, this mess around uh, New York where there's uh, every borough has its own map and then most of the uh, surrounding New Jersey counties uh, do as well. And it's, it's you know, we, we've got some things where you, uh, hopefully this, come on, there we go. Like you're gonna bring this one to the top. Come on, we'll slow today. Um, but but also this is this also just makes that argument uh, makes it clearer or makes it easier yeah. to use where you can just get rid of those and because these things butted up right against one another when they were doing the counties and doing the uh, doing the boroughs they just kind of the the grades end up fitting together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, so uh, I'm going to show one more thing which is uh, and I welcome really because I know the audience is tends to be uh, pretty technical and you guys are all making maps and so uh, like I'm. I'm a self-taught uh, developer and uh, don't have any uh, uh, any training in mapping or, or cartography. Um, my training is in some story. And um, so I, I would really love to uh, welcome uh, like any, any comments you have. And I'm gonna show you one more thing. One thing where this is very much a work in progress. Uh, let me go to this thing. So uh, we're, we're working on a project with the National Community uh, NCRC National Community Reinvestment uh, Coalition, and they've been look. They've been um, they're going to release a report soon that's about uh, the co the correlations between redlining in the past and health disparities today, uh, which we will eventually incorporate in and uh, about COVID. Um, so this is uh, just really a prototype of this, but this is showing where I live, which is Richmond, Virginia. And what uh, 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 it's kind of it's real data. It's not the data we'll use because they they've developed a kind of health uh, indices for each. And what I just did is I put the income level in. So you see, uh, you see, you kind of see obviously see just the the similarities between redlining in the past and uh, and uh, and wealth. Uh, these these are income levels rated on a zero to four through the census. Um, and then in the middle, I have a Sankey diagram, uh, which. Uh, lets you look at, uh, like this is the most gentrifying area uh, in, uh, in the city where I live. Uh, and a lot of that remains uh, predominantly African-American and, predom and pretty, uh, pretty poor, uh, I mean, and you see that. But a portion of it is highly gentrified and you see that that's, uh, a, 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 the size of this is reflective of the area of the overlap. Let me actually d d dive into that uh, a little bit more. Um, so. That's the overlap you see a little bit uh, towards the southern corner here, uh, which is yeah very very highly gentrified area in our our city. Uh, and let let's just see both. Uh, I'm hoping this thing will let you see both continuities and changes over time. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to stop because we were trying to keep this to 20 so we can have a conversation. So uh, I think we've gone over that. There are so many questions. <laughs> But this is incredible. I didn't. Okay, I'm just going to read you the questions. Um, you've got the Map Ninja, Map Tastic, Luke McKinnistry, uh, and McGene. All these questions. Um, the first one. It would I, be I, I saw one on there about um, restrictive covenants, and someone said, "Wouldn't it be interesting to to relate restrictive covenants to um, to the redlining grades?" And these were absolutely linked. So that's a that's a very meaningful. Um, correlation. Um, many of the, we know that the Federal Housing Administration um, promoted creating, local re realtors creating restrictive covenants to keep African Americans out, to basically keep conditions at the beginning of a mortgage so that 15 years or 25 years later, 
um, the conditions would be the same. Um, and then there's a number of initiatives in cities across the country. Maybe the best note is in Minneapolis uh, with Mapping Prejudice, which has mapped every restrictive covenant in Hennepin County. They've just, I think, um, completed that. It's a, it's a broad crowdsourced effort where I am in Charlottesville. There's been an effort, but it's not only those places. And particularly for, for example, cities that do not have like Hulk redlining maps, if someone leads an effort to map restrictive covenants, that can be an, you know, just as meaningful, possibly even more meaningful and effective way of tracking kind of local, um, local initiatives that reinforced reg racial segregation and racial inequality. Those are, those are hard to find. They were ruled unenforceable by the US Supreme Court in 1948. So, all of those documents exist in like your local county register of deeds or like the county clerk's office, but they're in analog form. And it takes a really uh, major effort to um, get those digitized and data entry and machine readable and so forth. Robert, you just answered a question in chat. Would you, would you verbalize it so folks have a little more context? Which one was, I've been answering a couple. Which one did I answer? Oh, <laughs> I'm like, read your answers out loud. You're so great. What, which, what was the question? Uh, uh, in those cases, uh, read the one about DC. Oh, is there one about DC? Well, DC doesn't have, if, that, if you're asking why there's not, DC is a really odd uh, exception that I, we keep asking the question, like, why isn't our DC map? So uh, a, lot, a lot of people, we get, I get emails every day saying, like, what about my city? And uh, <laughs> usually the answer is, the Hulk's cutoff was 40,000. Uh, and so if your city had less than 40,000 people in, uh, in the 1930s, uh, they didn't bother to survey it. Uh, there's a handful of cases where uh, we know there are maps that we just have not located. There's, there's one for Johnstown, uh, Jamestown, Jamestown, New York. I don't even know where that is. Uh, Port Amboy, uh, uh, New Jersey, Passaic County, New Jersey, and there's one other one um, that I recently realized uh, a map existed for. Uh, but in most cases, we've got them all. Uh, one notable, the most notable exception uh, and absence here is uh, is DC. And uh, you know, I speculate it might be because there's a federal program, and Congress obviously has some role in overseeing the district, and they just might not have wanted to just like raise any congressional flags. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the case or not, but DC is a really odd uh, odd uh, uh, exception. And you, the only explanation I have is that, uh, uh, that they, yeah, they just uh, didn't want to mess with something that has such uh, uh, legislative oversight. Uh, Dale, do you have any insight into DC beyond that? Todd does, and Todd Michney, and he, he does, he's a historian, he's working on this, and he's, uh, he knows more about the creation of these maps than anybody, I think, at this point. And, uh, he doesn't yeah. have an answer to that question either. Yeah, I think that the general answer that as a federal district, it didn't fall under regular rules or regular treatment. I think we found like one citywide map, which was basically like the Sanborn index map. And it was just like four districts. It was like Northwest, most desirable, you know, like Southeast, Southwest, hazardous. It was v extremely blunt and it was just a draft map. Um, there's there's actually the there's actually a pretty good uh, it's one of the few FHA uh, redlining maps and it's uh, available for the there's another great project I'll give a shout out that's largely about uh, about uh, re re restrict the covenants as well it's mapping segregation in Washington D.C. if you Google that you'll find a really uh, it uses the same schema I think, but I think the grade is goes from A to G because they they include some um, some other categories for commercial and and uh, governmental uh, areas. Um, but that's, that's the best uh, comparable map for DC. Somebody commented, it would, be, it would be interesting to look at things like local permits for teardowns in residential buildings, as well as real estate listings. I used to live in Lexington, Lexington Kentucky, and the redlined areas are now the places where teardowns and flipping take place. Yeah, I mean, I, I often say like there's, uh, I mean, this is this is blunt, but like three or four things happen to uh, areas that got redlined. They get uh, they get wiped clean and raised during urban renewal. They you know they they seize all the areas, slum areas, and they send in the bulldozers and they wipe it clean and start over with uh, 
sometimes housing, sometimes public housing, sometimes commercial or public uses or industrial uses. Uh, they uh, get wiped, down, wiped uh, during the same era for highways. Uh, they remain impoverished from then till now, or they gentrify. And uh, I mean, obviously there are exceptions to this, but those those tend to be the kind of like and gentrification. You can think of like is, in some ways, uh, the kind of uh, it's um, the, the way the predict the assumptions that Hulk was using become self uh, self fulfilling prophecies because they say these areas mm -hmm. like are, like can't be saved, and so they starve them of capital, and then they become you know, such, uh, such, uh, like almost like fallow areas that they, they, uh, attract investments, you know, in, in recent decades from those who want to develop and gentrify areas. Um, uh, so, you know, they, they kill it and, and, and let it, let it almost as, as from an investments perspective, not from a human perspective, but, uh, uh, but lie fallow for, for generations until it becomes just like a target of opportunity for predatory developers in the 21st century. I mean, with that um, example, Rob, that you gave for Richmond, the part of the D, the red lined area that had subsequently, like now is part of a um, wealthy um, Richmond census tract, that small slice, um, you know, what we would, in, what I would anticipate is since these were residential areas, there's probably a lot of teardowns recently in yeah. that, you know, the last 10, 10, 15 years in that area. And um, before that, there were probably a wide array of demolitions than like the 70s and 80s. And now, if, especially if it's near, since it's near like the um, edge of a, uh, of like the downtown area, there's probably, there was vacant land that could get scooped up for like tax, you know, tax bill purposes or something like that. And we're starting to get probably mid-rise commercial or residential buildings. And so it's not that those families who, you know, kind of like suffered over a couple generations really finally get some of the benefits of this investment. As you say, it's kind of a continuing pattern of uh, uh, like denial and disinvestment until somebody gets it for a song and they're like, aha, mm. now we're putting up the mid rise. Yeah. And okay. it's like, con 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 like uh, contributing to like um, the Richmond's like um, reinvestment efforts? Uh, no, <laughs> is that just right? in, this, in this case, because it's the 18, it's, this is the oldest part of the city. It's these 18th century houses mm -hmm. uh, that nobody wanted in the mid in the 1930s. They were, they were expensive. They were just kind of out of style. Uh, yet, you know, kind of the beginnings of white flight into the suburbs, and 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 all the you know the wealthy development was happening in these uh, these uh, streetcar suburbs on the edges of the city. And it's all, you know, but this is now the hot, uh, with recent trends, like people want to live in these 18th century houses. So they're not, they, what they are doing is they tend to, uh, it's not, it's not uh, wipe them down and put up a mid-rise. It is, uh, is got them from the inside and rebuild mm -hmm. them. So they're the 21st century houses in an 18th century container. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions in chat. Can you talk about, this is, this is Dale, I think this is your question. Can you talk about some of the development decisions you made? Like what libraries did you use? And then there's three more questions. Oh, uh, yeah, well, no, if it's libraries. Yeah. It's <laughs> okay, so the, um, probably uh, not actually, libraries, I, should, I should look at my package libraries. file and, and to, to figure that. So it's a, yeah. it's a, re, it's a React uh, app um, we use for, uh, as you see on the bottom, it's, it's leaflet. We use actually the React leaflet uh, abstraction layer. Um, there's, I don't really, I think I use D3 for a little bit of math, but usually not for, I usually just code things uh, layout wise, either using this kind of, uh, uh, CSS and some, you know, some positioning in CSS or, uh, or SVGs. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of detailed visualization here. So, um, and, you know, and we use other map box things that are for like, uh, map box has this great, pot, uh, I don't know if, if everyone uses this. Your poly label library is just kind of amazing. You know, this, uh, it's just, a, it's a little algorithm so that you can do, uh, you can, oops, sorry, I've got this. Oh, that's, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I got like three of these. One of these is, is Zoom. One of these is the actual one. And one of these is Twitch. I, 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 I had the totally wrong one. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, uh, this, uh, the poly labels library is great for figuring out like the pole of inaccessibility, place to put a, uh, the, 
you know, best place to put a, uh, a label. We have a like 7,000 of these things. I'm not putting them one by one. I need something to, uh, uh, yeah, to, you know, help me figure that out. So I uh, use your guys's, um, it, it, this is all on GitHub, by the way. So our GitHub, uh, account is American Panorama. Um, so if you want to look at the package file there, we, everything's up there uh, if anybody's, uh, interested, but it's, it's a pretty bespoke, I would say. Um, and we do obviously use, uh, some, some libraries like, uh, what, what we use in react as a framework we use in, uh, leaflet react, uh, uh, but uh, a lot of custom work is as well. Do you use a lot of G doll for like everything is, I, I swear we spent just a million years in G doll tiling these things and cutting, you know, doing some, uh, what do they call it? But, you know, cutting to the cut lines to get the individual, uh, individual neighborhood polygons. And uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of data, like everyone knows, a lot, a lot of data prep work. Oh, we also, uh, we, we use Cardo, uh, as we, we used the, the previous version of this used Cardo is, and their data, uh, their SQL API, uh, I now materialize everything as GeoJSON and JSON just to uh, reduce one dependency and speed things up a little bit. Data doesn't change, you know, it's historical. Mm -hmm. Two questions about your data, uh, both from Matt Ninja. Um, I'd be interested to hear how you manage the georeferencing pro project. It's massive. Oh. How did you manage the creation of the spatial data? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's a really good question. I, I really appreciate it because it gives me a chance to, uh, to uh, pay credit where credit is due and, cr and credit is due to us, uh, both for Gail and for me. Um, we've had students working on this in, in my lab for ever, uh, I mean, for years and years and years where they, uh, would, would georeference these maps, uh, and they then would create the polygons, uh, on top of them. And, uh, in recent, uh, years i'd say they've been concentrating on organizing transcribing and organizing the uh, area description data i mean there's no way we could have done this without a mountain i mean actually uh we're about let's pay some credit to them so uh like these are the students at our lab that um contributed an immense amount to that uh to this uh at uh at dale's uh Dale students also do a, a quite a bit of work. So um, we could not have done this. I mean, they, they are doing all the work that makes it possible for us to uh, use that data and develop on top of it. You know, the prep and the ingredients, they're sous chefs on this thing. Um, uh, yeah, setting us up to, to do what we want to do. Right on. Uh, another question, and we have about four minutes left. So if you have any closing thoughts, uh, feel free to move towards those. How does public housing projects built during the New Deal era tie into redlining policies? Public housing. So, so in a number of cases, these, these were um, most likely to be put in to um, the D, the red line, the hazardous neighborhoods. Not exclusively, but they were most likely. There was a hand, there were a handful of um, uh, public housing projects in the 1930s that we would call like New Deal housing, housing projects, um, many more in the 1940s and then into the 1950s. And those are much more likely to be in, um, you know, basically follow the logic of the redlined neighborhoods. So um, slum clearance, public housing, and um, highways. You know, if you layer those kinds of maps over a redlining map, you'll see clear correlations um, between those. And that's what I, you know, when I say the redlining maps are the Rosetta Stone um, that used that we learned to figure out um, um, linear B and um, ancient um, Egyptian hieroglyphic. It's like you can translate from one era or from one program to another because these, this process of creating the maps and assembling the data informed federal policy makers, um, you know, like visions for like what cities would look like for the rest of the 20th century. Um, and then when you decide to like withhold federal support uh, or, or, or like um, federal investment, it, you know, it like necessarily sends a, um, you know, neighborhood kind of like spiraling into greater distress, greater poverty, and, um, and it signals to private investors not to invest also. And so, as Rob said, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy in some fashion.
And I, 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 I check this out. I won't go into detail because obviously we're short on time, but we have another kind of companion piece to this called Renewing Inequality, which looks at family displacements during urban, uh, due to urban, federally funded urban renewal projects in the wow. 1950s and 1960s. And I, what I'm showing here is Richmond underlaid with the uh, Hulk uh, grades from the 1930s. And as you can see there, uh, all the neighborhoods, uh, there's Carver neighborhood, which is placed by five, about 500. Uh, families, 99% of them being black families, and 17th Street, same number, about the same percentage. Uh, this is a black neighborhood. That's a black neighborhood, actually. You can put this under the more purple it is, uh, the uh, more it's a neighborhood of color. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, encourage everyone to check that out if you're interested in uh, another kind of monumental uh, uh, federal housing program that has a lot of racial disparities in it, too. This is this has been such an incredible presentation. Thank you for, for diving so deep into everybody's questions. I think maybe a, a good place for us to land is like, the question in my mind is, is like, why be a digital historian? Like, why? Well, why? Uh, yeah, I have an answer to that. I mean, so, well, partly it's because I'm uh, uh, like, this is a moment where you're kind of uh, like, OCD uh, really is it advantageous, I would say, one thing, like, or, or being like kind of spectrum-y, I guess it's like, this is my sweet spot. But <laughs> a little more seriously, it's like one, one thing that, particularly with mapping inequality that I found so, um, so uh, rewarding is that it's uh, like two things I'd say. It's like, one, it reaches a, a far bigger audience than anything I've ever written. I mean, like far bigger, like in a day, it reaches a far bigger audience <laughs> than anything I've ever written is gonna, gonna reach. So. Just the, the reach of this uh, is uh, impactful. And I, so I'm always amazed by what like activists and people on the ground are just citizens are just doing with these maps. I mean, it's, it's really moving to have them impact policy or, or impact and inform conversations about, um, well, about race and inequality. And particularly in the last, I mean, we had about, uh, I think it was like 120 thousand page views last month and picked up because of uh, obviously it was kind of a broad reckoning that's happening with race and so we got a, a big bump for a june uh been, been an average june for us and the other thing i'd say is uh g we give away the data here um let me actually bring i got a got too many windows uh we give away all the data and and people just do remarkable things with the data. So there's uh, been some uh, amazing work. Like one of my favorites is somebody's uh, group of scientists have correlated redlining with urban heat island effects in the 21st century, the, the, the disparities between how hot it is on the hottest day of the year, and it's a lot cooler in neighborhoods that were rated A than neighborhoods that were rated D. Um, and uh, that, that research is, they can only do that because we've made, uh, the data is now available. Um, so. Uh, if you're interested in using this, we encourage you to. So we've got a shape file at GeoJSON that's got the entirety of this, and we give away um, all the uh, all the georectified information, so you can get any individual city, uh, city as a shape file or GeoJSON. You get our georectified image, the scan, and you can download a zip file with the uh, error description. So we're trying to give everything away, and it's been amazing how how uh, productively and thoughtfully people have used it, doing stuff we wouldn't have anticipated. In, and I would just say that it's, um, you know, both critical because of the concern with like humanistic, humanistic research and um, like humanistic questions. Ours, we came to like, what is, um, what are some of the constituent elements and constituent programs that are reinforcing, like creating and reinforcing racial inequality? And what are the uh, what is the what is the spatial nature of this inequality? Like those two really fundamental concerns um, intersect at homeownership, loan corporation, redlining, and the project mapping inequality. So it's critical, and because of that collaborative nature of our project and the way that we open this data to so many other researchers, journalists to do. Um, research and inquiries in their own communities um, in ways that we would never have like thought of and never like be able to uh, like conduct I think then then it's enabling the work of many other people and I think um, is uh, can, can have a great deal of impact because this is a digital humanities project <laughs>